So welcome. This is the Backbone Small Business Podcast. We're a part of the Tundra and Podcast Network. This is our second episode. And today we are speaking with Tara Black of Origin Gluten-Free Bakery. Um, originally, the Backbone was supposed to be an opportunity for us to talk to other small business owners because I, along with my partner Cindy, own the Wet Cleaner a non-toxic dry cleaner here in Victoria, BC, and we've owned it for about 13 years. And we were just gonna chat with people, and Tara was on my hit list for sure. We've known each other for quite a while. Um, she is a successful, uh, with a capital S, uh, gluten-free bakery here in Victoria, makes a killer product, and I'm always in awe of what she and her partner, Marion, do. Um, so I was gonna, it was gonna be an opportunity for us to sit down, in the not too distant future, relax, maybe have a coffee, maybe have a wine, chat about her experience in business. And um, as she's Thank sitting you. on her coffee right now, <laughs> jump into it. we've got COVID-19 hit us all like a brick wall. And so what I'm trying to do with this emergency broadcast, if you will, of <laughs> this, uh, the backbone, is to talk to people like yourself and find out what you've had to deal with of late and maybe what are some creative entrepreneurial solutions you've come up with and then uh, maybe get into what we could ask the government for. So Tara, maybe you can give <laughs> us a little bit. Tell us about well, your, your shop. Um, well, uh, the gluten-free bakery. We also have a gluten-free cafe, uh, which is to date two months old and we're closing its doors on Saturday. So that's a Timing bit of a shock. Everything. Timing is everything. Timing is everything. Um, we're closing the doors only temporarily. So not to be dramatic or anything like that about it. Um, but yeah, COVID, it definitely has adjusted how everybody's looking at things, how we're integrating um, everything, so. It's been a bit challenging over the last week and a half, for sure. Uh, Origin, as a company, employs 44 people. So uh, it's never actually felt like a burden um, to employ 44 people until the last two weeks. So How so? I mean, obviously, you know, I'm not being naive. Your cash flow yeah. has been hammered like everybody <laughs> else. But when yeah. you say... Um, now, 44 people, how many of you had to lay off? How many of you have been able to keep on? Uh, well, two weeks ago, uh, we had a, ooh, okay, let's say, let's go into days, considering everybody's working on a 12-hour clock these days. Um, I'd say it was about 18 days ago that we had our first employee uh, go down. Um, they themselves are immune suppressed so they're um, definitely susceptible to anything that might be caught and going around they felt very cautious so they actually went through the testing for COVID came back negative um, but because of their own personal health and well-being they elected to just stay away until everything's dealt with uh, and then after that it was just kind of a trickle effect um, two more employees, three more employees, um, all making the personal choice to stay out, which we totally respect 100%. Um, the good thing about having 44 employees is that you're able to mitigate the change in the availability for people. Um, so then last week, we came around to that we needed to really change some of the operational procedures for both of the bakery and the cafe, uh, reducing our hours down. Um, last week, we decided to go down to four hours for retail uh, at both locations, which, to be honest, uh, from a cash flow perspective, didn't actually change that much of our revenue. Um, I think collectively over the two stores, we were down maybe three three thousand dollars for the week. Um, but that's not an entirely sustainable idea. So as of last, well, I don't even know what day of the week it is right now. Tuesday. 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 Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so on Saturday, 
um, I processed the first wave of ROEs, all employees that have self-elected. So we didn't actually say to anybody, hey, you're laid off, there's a shortage of work or anything like that. Um, 18 of the 44. Um, this morning, I gave notice to 12 of the remainder that as of this coming Saturday, um, we'd be putting them on temporary layoff. Um, all of them are on temporary. All of them have an anticipated return to work date. Um, and we've been really fortunate. All of these employees are still engaged with us on our um, corporate communication channels. So they're not, they're not all just drifting off and then we won't see them again. They're all really anticipating coming back to work, which is really hopeful. Uh, and then we're left with, I think at this point, we're left with 10 to kind of go forward for where we're going now, which we're going to be going to uh, online sales only. We have an online store, so we have the capacity to switch to just delivery options, which is really, really useful. Um, well, you, and you've always had, sorry to interrupt, you've always had uh, an online component to your sales, right? And, and the reality yeah. is... I, I speak, I can comfortably speak for anybody that's tried your, uh, tried your, your baked goods that it's comfort food. You're going to feel better eating what you're producing, um, yeah. especially if you're, if you're gluten intolerant. Um, so I, that makes a lot of sense that your sales didn't really hit that much. I mean, obviously it hit some, some, yeah. other, but now of late, has it started to decline? Are you, are you finding that that's happening or people? You, know, people you would think so. You would think so. I mean, um, our sales have declined on the days that were closed simply because we're not open. Um, but today we were only open for four hours at both stores. Um, the West Shore did, oof, let's say $400 less than they would do in a typical day. And the Pandora store did about $700 less than they would do in a typical day, which, I mean, realistically, between the two stores, we typically see around $5,000 a day in sales. So the customer base that we're working with see us as essential. Um, it's, it's, one of, it's a funny word, essential, like being an essential service. What does that mean? Um, and I was asked years and years and years ago why I'm in the food industry. Quite honestly, it's my hobby. <laughs> I never actually thought that I was gonna make this my career. I always knew that it would allow me to travel because it doesn't matter where you go, it doesn't matter where you are, people need to eat. And if you have a skill that allows you to make some money no matter where you are, then you're pretty set, right? Well, you're, and you're it, I'm, I, knowing you as well as I do, you're one of these, uh, these uh, crazy people that you're able to, uh, <laughs> what you do, what you get paid to do is what you do for pleasure on the evenings and on the weekends. You might yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it incorporate family members as you're moving through that, right? It's a, it's a little disturbing. I realized due to, the, um, due to the COVID chaos is what I've been calling it. Um, I typically have a really, really awesome work schedule. Um, and my work schedule has been a part of that chaos. And I haven't had an actual day off in probably 14, 16 days, which I'm not complaining. It's, I actually like what I do, um, but it's just different than the norm. And then I found my only day off was Sunday. And what did I find myself doing was baking bread. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I, I actually saw that on your social media. Yes, yes, yes. it's a uh, here we go baking bread. We're gonna you know bake all week and then bake it. All. Yeah. But I remember when you first started the business, <laughs> your goal of starting the business was so that you could have scheduled time off. That was yeah, I believe that was number one. It, and it actually still is number one. Um, so for that, like honestly. Uh, we really value the amount of time that people are willing to give us in order to serve our community. So our employees, the amount of time that they're willing to put into their work to me is as valuable as my own time. So we really want to respect that. And 
from the chaos that has been going on and the responsive and reactive ways in which we're all stepping into those different areas, the amount of time that's taken from everybody from even just a mental standpoint, um, before they're even at work, people are mentally exhausted by all of this. So we made the decision this week to, um, we're closing the stores for retail effective as uh, Friday at two o'clock. So, and we've told everybody, you know, regardless of you being laid off temporarily or you're gonna still be working um, for the online store and for the wholesale, um, we're, we're shutting things down Saturday, Sunday, Monday. No production, nobody in the stores. Everybody go just chill. Literally go home, rest in your bed, watch movies. Take some time for yourself. Do whatever you need yeah, to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like really, purposefully make time for that um, because nobody knows how long these measures are going to be in place for. Um, and I, I find actually in these moments is where, uh, when you said earlier, the creativity, that creativity is what brings you some of the, the best forward momentum, right? So I mean, as it is, we're actually engaging with another company uh, and onboarding their products into our product line, which will help to offset um, hours and wages for our employees. It'll give us more breadth to a whole new customer base. So even though we're gonna mitigate people into the stores, we're still looking at how to get new and better products out to more people. So, so you're I, thinking- Kind of weird. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. You're you're taking this opportunity to uh, maybe fast track something you'd already were discussing yeah. uh, to onboard other other products. So you're looking at it really as an opportunity. This potentially is an opportunity, and it it's interesting to me because yeah. I spoke with um, uh, our first episode. I spoke with Vanessa Sullivan, um, owns a CrossFit affiliate in town, uh, and you know she's doing something similar where she's pivoting and saying, okay, well, how can I ensure that I'm able to move forward, you know, take care of my, my customers and take care of my staff and also continue to grow the business because after all, that's why we're all kind of doing this, right? Exactly. I mean, the reason why it's a business and not a hobby is because you're actually trying to produce something to further uh, <laughs> one, your community, but further your own income in order for you to exist within this, right? So. Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. That's, yeah, I started this business, I mean, you know, during this crisis, so what are you going to do, right? It's, it's a podcast, but I'm hoping I can turn it into. I think it's going to be great. Cindy uh, made mention of it a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So, <laughs> uh, is there, now, it sounds like, you know, um, to be blunt, you're, you're not in a situation where your revenue is tanking, so you're maybe not so worried about how you're going to pay the rent. Um, oh, I am. You, you are. Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> so, sorry to, to, to assume that. So, so Cher, what, what, what are you doing when the rubber hits the road? What are some of the measures you're taking to engage with your landlord, um, Hydro? If, if any of those things are, are required, what are some of the measures you're uh, in employing to engage with those people? Well, we're in this, like, we're in a very, not a unique situation to anybody within small business or even business on general. In fact, um, some of the things that I was looking into is just like looking over the course of history. Um, small business is actually really resilient because we're nimble, because we're small. Like we're able to actually pivot. Um, we're able to take a hold of a creative idea and fast implementations of it. Um, large business, those are the um, those are the ones that I'm I'm actually more worried about because they don't have the ability to pivot. Their infrastructures are vast and overreaching, um, and you you see things happening where there's no fast change um, and a very fast consequence. Whereas small business, we have that ability to say, like I was saying, for example, um, this partnering with another company, we've been in talks with them for six months. And I was like, you know what, we can do it now. I've been 
going, okay, well, we had this cafe going um, and coming and we just want to get that up off the ground and running. And we were thinking, okay, as soon as Easter's over, we'll start engaging with this other company. And all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, this is the perfect timing to deal with this challenge right now while we're dealing with this massive challenge that nobody saw coming. So let's run with that ball. Great. Um, a larger company, not able to pivot that quickly, right? So in that scenario, um, being able to capture the ideas and actually implement them really quickly is, is one of those things that helps to alleviate. Um, unfortunately, we just spent $450,000 um, on a brand new space that means all of our savings is in that space. That means all of our capital is all wiped out. Um, it's a gorgeous space. Customers love it. We're really excited about it. Um, it was doing really well. And even today, it did really well given the circumstances. Um, but it means we don't have tons of cash flow that we're sitting on top of. So that in itself puts us in a weird predicament because, I mean, you've known me for years. I'm always sitting on a cushion. Like there's always something that is going to allow for something to hit, but it's okay because there's a bit of a cushion to, to bounce off of or to absorb into a little bit. Right now there's no cushion. I mean, I'm like, okay, wait a minute. If there's $75,000 worth of payables that literally have to go out the door before April 15th, and I only have revenue of like three grand a day, that's not good math. No, <laughs> like it's, not. it's just not good math. So, I mean, it, it, will we be able to go through that? Yeah, like leverage all the different avenues that you have for credit being available, using it wisely so it doesn't end up drowning you in debt. Yes, um, talking with our landlords. Um, both landlords, though, aren't local. So thankfully, and this is a really weird thing to say thankfully, um, thankfully COVID's global. It is globally recognized as having a huge economic uh, impact. So hopefully uh, one set of landlords is based in China. Another set of landlords is based back east in Nova Scotia. Um, so at least we know that when we're communicating with them saying, hey, this is what's going on. This isn't isolated news to us. It is a global piece of the conversation. So there is some more understanding. But we're dealing with two big companies that they don't have the ability to pivot like we do. Um, and we're the ones who understand the pressure so much, right? Like rent's due next week. So. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's so. so Can you give us a break or. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I hear that. And, and that's, you know, certainly the discussion that, that I'm having with pretty well every other small business owner. So, you know, in, um, maybe wrap it up with what might you suggest to any government ears that would be listening to this uh, and watching this video, because I, I might actually be sending it to, uh, to some politicians. And is there anything that they right. can do, do you think that can help, but would it be um, a trickle down effect from the top on down or what, what, what might you suggest? Yeah, I wish I, su I wish I could suggest something that would be, crucial and impactful. Um, I think the scale of business, uh, the scale of the economy that Canada works in is thought to be quite huge uh, because of our landmass. It was something that I was realizing the other day um, in looking at countries that are quite small, but they have still like huge population base and they're quite condensed. Um, and you look at Canada, we have such a wide country, like literally geographically, it's massive. Um, our population's really actually quite stretched out, which may be one of the reasons why COVID's going to be not easier to contain, but at least more manageable. Um, but the economic pressures that we're seeing 
are so far reaching and mostly as much as it's going to impact businesses, it's more, it's more impactful on the individuals. Um, so if individuals are given the resources to be involved in the economics of their region, I think that'll have more impact on small business in particular than if there's some kind of bailout for small business. I mean, I'm a small business. Trust me, I'd love some kind of help. Any kind of help would be great. Um, debt servicing isn't really the answer because us bearing the brunt of taking out more loans with interest rates is that's damaging to us on a very long run, even if it's an immediate help. Um, I, I, agree but if with, we were, I agree with that statement because that's something that yeah. I, I've read. And I, again, I haven't, uh, I'm, I'm going to dive in more into what uh, the, the government has come out with, but that's something I, I find is scary. It's, you know, dangling this thing of, oh, you can get another loan. It's like, well, you got to pay for that on the other end. And that's, you know, yeah. the, one of the things I thought of, if it's a three month hit we're talking about, if it's 90 days of kind of shutting down the economy, 60 or 90, then, you know, maybe it's a trickle down where they do say, to the to the lenders uh let's give you give mortgage uh lenders a break give landlords a break so that they don't they can have the trickle down effect that they can pass it on so that you know origin doesn't have to pay its rent for three months or you know whatever and and, and that might be something that would help so it's not nobody's actually going into debt it's more of a pause i don't know the logistics around that but but it seems like that yeah but it's kind of like that in itself right i mean from the first step, it seems like it could be a logical consequence, but for, for instance, like in any business, and you and I know this, um, for every pause, it's, it's about three times that amount of time in order to see the um, actual result. So if it's like a 90 day pause, that's not 90 day pause and then back at it that's three six nine months that's christmas no, it's, it's, there, that's, there's a wrap up I, unlike what some people have said where they're going to see a v curve on it it ain't going to be a v curve no no it would be what i if if there was a, a lovely picture to this quite honestly if they were able to look at every business's gross revenue and give them 10 percent, like if you were able to give us 10% of what we do as a gross revenue, as a, a way to say, hey, we know you're taking this huge hit, here's 10%. This will help you ride the wave and you still have to pay your taxes. You still have to pay your vendors. You still have to pay your leases. You still have to pay your staff but here's 10% of what your gross revenue was based on last year's taxes. Based on your corporate taxes from last year, we're gonna give you 10% in order to help you offset, but in a way that it keeps the economy going. Not like the idea of saying, you don't need to pay your taxes until September. Like you can defer payment until September. That's not don't pay taxes and then resume in September. That's deferring all of the tax and then having a lump sum owing. That's, that's just a looming cloud. That's not something that actually allows anybody the breathing room it needs. Whereas, you know, and I'm coming up with 10% only because 10% is being used a lot in a lot of the remediation plans that they're putting forth. Like if somebody were to look at my gross revenue and say, for number sake alone, easy math, I do a gross revenue of $1 million. You give me 10% of that, it's $100,000. Is that enough to help a small business stay on its feet? Yes. That's enough to make sure that the lease is paid, that the rents um, or the, the vendor payments are paid, that your staff wages are paid, that your source deductions for having your staff get sent into the government. The government's not gonna lose out on what needs to go back into the system in order to, in 12 months now, pay for somebody's EI because they're legitimately out of work due to a different circumstance. 
or to pay for the Canadian pension plan that needs to stay <laughs> within our working order, um, to pay for the income tax that people pay for that actually allow for all of this money that could be doled out to come from, right? Like, yeah, no, I get it. That's that's a that's a good solution. I mean, I I like that, and I I I, I that's the something that does scare me is the deferment, the talk of deferment, talk of um, you know loans and all those things. It it's going to put this, as you said, this this looming cloud, this massive burden yeah. as as a small business we're going to get hit with, and so we're going to somebody's got to pay the piper in any of those scenarios, and it's it once it once it comes due. Once those rents are due, once those payments are due, it's going to be a big deal. It's going to be a heavy burden to bear. Mm -hmm. So, uh -huh. I don't know. 10% is a really big number. It's not, it's not a sustainable number. It's not an actual, like, implemental number. Be a great number. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'd receive that no problem. But Sounds good. Well, I think, you know... Uh, on that note, I, I, it does make a lot of sense, and I'm going to continue to have these conversations. And this will certainly be this podcast will be will be a part of it. And I appreciate your time, Tara. Thank you very much. All You're the welcome, best. Dave. Thanks for talking. Ciao. Bye.